Fans of the channel at this point know that I like my big smashy robots. I like dinosaurs, mostly, but I do like big smashy robots. On a recent trip to Japan, I was lucky enough to be able to pick up and ship home not only a Gundam Holy Grail kit, but a Holy Grail kit of models in general. The Strike Freedom Master Grade Extreme. On paper, the Strike Freedom MGX represents the pinnacle of nearly 40 years of engineering by Bandai. Yeah, it has been that long. In fairness, I also picked up a Gundam kit from the 80s, and while the principles are very much unchanged over the decades, I expect the Master Grade Extreme to fit better, pose better, and probably look infinitely better. So join me as I build arguably the greatest model kit ever made, scratch build, and paint an entire diorama to go with it, and weather the model to take center stage. What's up my movers and shakers? I'm Dave, this is MS Paints, and this is the Strike Freedom Master Grade Extreme. Okay, time is short and I have got a lot to do. I've got about seven days in total to do everything, which isn't much time. Thankfully, Bandai are coming straight out the gate by packing in a runner stand for my sprues, which bumps me up to a 7 out of 10 on the happy scale today. Like with a majority of Gundam kits, this guy comes with a multicolored sprue. I assume that is done with multiple injection points and closed gates in the mold, but what's interesting is that there's actually different kinds of plastic being put into this thing. Which means the clear, the regular, and the soft poseable stuff is going to be injected probably at different temperatures. And the model's poseable hands clip off the sprue in one piece, which is kind of insane to say that that is all on the sprue just as is. The first thing we're building with this kit is the internal skeleton, or I suppose that's a regular skeleton. While a lot of kits will see you build in complete heads, arms, bodies and legs and putting them together, this guy asks you to build the internal structure first and then add all of the visible external stuff on later. It's kind of almost a bit of a joke at how confident Bandai are with this kit. The amount of detail that is going to be covered up in the later stages is actually frightening. The only reason these details really exist is to satisfy the builder. Because once the model's done, you're the only person who would ever know what was underneath. And that just feels kind of special. Extra might be the word. All in all, nothing shy of a joy was had in this part of the build. These guys are clearly proud about how far they've come, and it feels like I've shared a moment with the designers in how well this is made. Sounds mushy, but you know, Gundam kits put me in a, in a real nice zen space. We're going to talk more about how I feel about this kit after these messages and how you can be with a chance to win one of these kits for yourself. <laughs> What's up guys, Tony Sanders here, back in perpetual full of motion, and I'm here to talk to you today about today's sponsor, Wayland Games. Tony Sanders! It's your very Merry Christmas from everybody here at the Wayland Games. My favorite Gundam is back, and with a rebuild, it's Ariel, guys. Her shield turns into a load of little laser drone things and destroys other giant robots. What more could you want, guys? Fancy something with a little funk? Well, my boy Gelgoog is keeping Disco alive with these cool flares and a red finish. Need something a little more serious? Well, it's the Zacco 2 Red Comet version, guys. This guy just reeks of classic design and stable posability. Also, he's pink, and that, that is a statement. Tony Sanders! Now we're talking, guys. Big robot with a sword. And what it, what is that? What is this guy? Is he... What? <laughs> anyway guys, I don't want to force an impulse buy here, but the 1100 Master Grade Force Impulse Gundam is a staple in any dinner table conversation. What did you do today, honey? Well, I impulsively forced Gundam. 
Shall let a Mercury cannon by Tony Sanders. Oh, and you're gonna need some action bases, guys. Don't ask me why, but get them while they're hot. Hot contender for second favorite Gundam here, guys. The Gundam density. You heard that right. Fresh and funky design. And look at those wings. It's like a robot soul weaver. Finally, at last, the surfing Gundam. I don't know who this guy is. I don't know what he's doing. But if you put a giant robot on a surfboard at 2470, I'm in, baby. I'm in. Yes! When Justin Bieber was singing Esposito, this is the robot he was talking about, guys. Esposito. Cannon bike! And at 1425, we got the Strike Gundam. You can't really go wrong with a high grade at this price, guys. A couple of relaxed evenings with some clippers and a model kit. Oh, hey, it's your boy, Shinanju. Oh, yeah, he's big, he's red, and he's got a bazooka. This is the kind of Santa we need this time of year. But of course, if you guys have got your heart set on a Strike Freedom Master Grade Extreme like the one that d Dog's making in this video, well, today is your lucky day. All you gotta do is place an order for any Gumpla or Gundam kit on the Wayland Games website and you are gonna be automatically entered into the raffle to win the 1100 Strike Freedom Master Grade Extreme. Full terms and conditions can be found in the link in the description and the pinned comments, guys. And while you're on the Wayland Games website, why not check out the largest supply of the Warhammers and every other hobby brand that I can personally think of right now. You know that stuff costs less at Wayland. Wayland. All right, sayonara! Cannon bike! Okay, so there is a lot to like about the Gundam Strike Freedom Master Grade Extreme. <laughs> what I've done so far is build the skeleton, which is essentially like an armature that you might get in a stop motion model, I guess. The, the skeleton that goes inside. And as far as I'm aware, the other half of the kit now needs to go on. Um, and by other half, I mean just the external half. There's lots of weird, funky articulation going on. The fact that kind of like tendons what in a human would be a tendon um the tendons move they do stuff uh based on what another part of the body is doing so if i move the bottom part of the leg everything in the knee joint moves there's a part of the thigh that moves um to accommodate that and the whole thing is just kind of a considering it's a model kit it is a mechanical work of genius to be fair uh there's no glue it pops together um, it's got all these weird mechanical parts. Some of it is actually metal. And if I'm being honest, it is a damn shame that I have to cover the majority of this up with the external armor. I imagine the external armor will be just as beautiful though. <laughs> so if I learn anything with the, uh, the, the weathering that Tony was doing, um, with Big Tony, that video is up there if you want to see an angry little man make a load of mistakes. The key thing I took away from that is that while the clear primer trick uh, trademark that we have on MS Paints does normally work. Um, it can often be inconsistent and unreliable with the various different things that you put on. Basically, I want to use those acrylic shaders and I want to use them properly. And I don't know if they're going to behave themselves properly over like an ultra matte primer, uh, an ultra matte varnish. So I am going to commit basic Gundam sacrilege and I am going to prime my sprues the correct colors <laughs> so yeah i'm gonna prime them and then i'm gonna finish the model nice So we're moving on to the wings. For the Strike Freedom, the wings are probably the coolest part. It gives it such a unique silhouette compared to other kits. And depending on what you do with those wings, you can drastically change the pose and the silhouette of the model. After the wings, I'm going into the primed armor. 
As expected, this armor mounts entirely onto the skeleton, so none of the exterior stuff connects to other exterior stuff, meaning any posing or movement you had previously will come across once it's complete. And even though I don't have any microsole or in fact anything to do these water decals properly, I'm going to give it a go anyway. You know, I've never actually been able to figure out whether these decals are called water slide transfers or water slide transfers. So is it water slide, water slide, or is it water slide? Let me know in the comments. Water slide, water slide, or water slide. Let me know, guys. I need to know. Okay, so Gumpla Building has potentially overstayed its welcome to my core demographic, so it's time to smash on with the diorama build. Based on some insulation foam that I pulled from a skip this very morning, that's a very nifty find. This foam is garbage for general foam crafts since it's like it's like prison foam. They cut this stuff with brick dust and fiberglass, so a hot wire tool just won't go through it. However, it is perfect as a solid base and hacking great lumps out of it. My approach to this build is some fresh destruction. My normal go-to for terrain and dioramas is long abandoned and weather blasted stuff. In this case, I want it to look about half an hour old, tops, taking the front of the block away to show an underground area and some trashed sewer pipes. This is mostly done so I can get the camera in there later on uh, and go for some nice low boob roll shots, but hey, two Gundams, one stone. Our central road is made of a fine grain cork board. I have no idea where I got this sadly, but it's the last of it and it will work perfectly for this one 100 scale we're working in. With all the major pieces planned and mapped and landforms carved, I need to get these 3D printed buildings cut and flush with the edge of the diorama. Elf and Safety Frog was busy watching Santa with muscles at this point, so we did it in the most dangerous but time efficient way possible. Even though these are going to end up a lighter colour, I prime all my concrete stuff in black and work up with stippling, relying on the transparency of the paint to give it a more patchy finish. With a lot of my board builds, I like to keep them as cheap and as light as possible, and to keep the processes as quick as possible. So I'm going with a tin foil to create the basic ground undulations. Roads need rebar, and for the sake of three quid, whatever this mesh stuff is from the hobby shop is going to save me a good 20 minutes faffing around with wire and cocktail sticks, so in that goes. Rather than 3D printing some telephone poles and making life easy for myself, I am 
scratch bashing three of them together. I'm hoping that by tagging together some basic shapes and greebly bits, I can create something that looks enough like a telephone pole to sell as a telephone pole in the final piece. I normally obsess over small details, but with this project, I don't really have time to do that. So I'm winging it and relying on the full piece, bringing everything together and people being able to go, that's the telephone pole. Same rule applies to this reservation divider thing going alongside the road. No idea what those are actually called, but cocktail sticks and plastic card do the job. It's time to blend all of these elements together with some ghetto sculptor mold. Sculptor mold is great, but it is a little bit pricey and I don't actually have any now. So for me, a 25 kilogram bag of thermoflock and a 10 kilogram bag of plaster and a cold water tap has lasted me about five years and it's still going strong. I use this stuff instead of filler or clay because it sets in about 10 minutes and dries virtually weightless. Okay, rubble. Cheapest, easiest, fastest way to make rubble is plaster and a hammer. I pour a basic plaster of Paris or cast in plaster mix into a baking tray. Not my baking tray, obviously, this is my mum's baking tray. And that is the best kind of baking tray. Smash it up, filter out the largest pieces that are too big for the diorama, and you're left with a tray of rubble that you can just heap and throw onto the project. PVA isn't going to hold the plaster, but I seem to have forgotten this. Uh, and as we apply more finer grip materials like terrarium grit and this Keep Gaming Scenic sand, the glue will work to hold those finer parts down. For the plaster, I recommend nothing short of Poundland Special Super Glue. It's a little pricier this way, but honestly, it's the only thing I've found to lock everything down in under a few minutes. With everything dried overnight, it's time to get some sidings on. These are just nuts and bolts foam core from the craft shop. Once that's done, I'll plug any height differences around the diorama to make seamless edges. And once I'm happy with that, a little more ground cover to get the textures texturing. I often get asked what I'm doing with all these liquids after laying the ground texture. And the first bottle is a mixture of isopropyl alcohol and water. But what this does is kick a capillary action that soaks all the materials through. I then use some matte scenic sealant from Geek Came In Scenics or some variant thereof. And this is now able to soak deep into the top layer and lock it all down to the layer beneath it.
decent. All right. It's my last day on this thing, and now I have to paint everything. <laughs> my main method is to work up from black primer and stipple overbrush and dry brush my way to victory. Stippling is a nice way to add color, but still maintain a feathered effect between colors. Airbrushing also works, but I'll be using the airbrush for one technique and then switching to the brush again for another. And there just ain't enough time to play with that either. So it's just me, some paint and a medium sized artist opus brush. I'm sorry, Byron, this, this, this brush may not survive, fella. My concrete recipe is a black base and two thin coats sandstone, or whatever approximation you can find. Again, all stippled on, so a little bit of that black is still showing through in sparse patches. And then we go over the sandstone with two thin coats, Caradron Grey, I think I pronounced that right. And of course, once again, allow a little patchiness here and there to come through. Concrete has a fairly complicated variation in shades over time, and rather than adding physical texture to this, which won't be easy at 1-100 scale, we can imply texture and variation with these patchy colours. For more variation, enamel washes. Why enamel? Well, I like the sort of gradients it dries with. Uh, I'm not shading recesses on a model with this. I've got a lot of flat surfaces that need a quick bit of color variation. And enamel or oil washes give me that and go much further for the cost. Optional step, I think it doesn't need it, and it actually looks a bit naff, but a sponge with some off-white on the concrete building is going on for reasons I'm not sure why. Last little touch with some acrylic shaders from Ammo Mig, whatever they're called, etc, etc. They don't show up especially well on camera, but they do add a nice bit of blending in the final thing. I did a whole two minutes of research and found some interesting road markings being pioneered in certain prefectures in Japan. I remember seeing some of those while I was out there in June. I've, I've no idea what they meant. I, I, I thought they were a footpath thing. Um, some drivers definitely told me they weren't a footpath thing with their car horns. Uh, but I like the look of them, and I think it'll help sell the road a little bit better. So here we are with some fresh and funky mint green road lines. With all this concrete and destruction going on, I fancied myself a little bit of a roadside garden. Because you know it's 3.30pm on my last day working on this, I definitely need to throw more stuff on there. I'm going quite cute and fun here with a little bit of Boomer Railway scenic chic. Hey, don't knock it, everything we do today came from railway guys. Basic principle of adding the bigger, chunkier stuff on first, like the foam, clump, flock, and then gradually working our way down to the finest materials we have. And these element essentials fallen petals were a nice surprise to find in my drawer, and I really like the splash of colour that they add. Again, seal it, seal it, seal it. One base layer of glue, some ISO, and a sealant will nail this shut just fine.
Right, so let's address these sewer pipes. I don't want to go all check off sewer pipe on you guys, but if it's there, it should probably be serving a purpose. So I'm going to have one of these pipes spewing some water out. Using the last of my clear fix, which is an acrylic based, not silicon based, as Luke likes to remind me, and that's a big important difference, I can sculpt the water flow in about five minutes. Now I've usually had great success with resin pores, this one wasn't one of them. And we didn't get any brutal leaks or anything like that, I sealed it up quite well but the ratios were probably a smidge off because I wasn't measuring the ratios and the workshop dropped to around minus five centigrade over the weekend when, you know, when I left this to cure and yeah, the resin is still a little soft even at the time of completion. Okay, the very last thing to do is to paint our Strike Freedom Master Grade Extreme. Yeah, you remember that guy from earlier in the video? Well, with that model's armor primed earlier on, we can actually go in with some acrylic shaders and washes and take that white armor down a stop. I can also add some panel lining and as much as I tried not to get enamel anywhere near this thing i really eased back on how much i used and kept it just to the lines as best i could and i'm quite happy with that mr sponge is back for some chipping just grays on the dark grays pure white on the white some pale blue on the blue like say there is no time left on this project so we are absolutely just ticking the basics here. No deep scouring or rust patches on this guy. Remember, this is kind of meant to be a fresh fight, fresh diorama. No ancient weathering going on, but some light metallic chipping on the edges of the panel is going to help us get to that finish line nice and subtle. and a couple more shaders and filters applied to the bottom of the legs. Delightful. And here we are guys. I've left the Gundam freely posable instead of gluing him down. I haven't actually decided on a final pose yet, I don't know what's cooler. So maybe I'll just keep changing it every few months to keep my life fresh. I'd like to give a big thank you to Wayland Games for sponsoring this video and hooking me up with Bandai who in turn hooked me up with a Strike Freedom model for this build, and also then in turn hooked Wayland Games up with some Strike Freedom Master Grade Extremes to give away. Beautiful synergy right there. Remember guys, if you want to be in with a chance of winning one, all you got to do is pick up a Gundam from waylandgames.co.uk and that enters you into the competition. 
And you know, considering I actually had to go to Japan to get one of these things, this is probably the easiest way for you to get hold of one, if you want one. Which you do. You definitely do want one of these. I would also like to give a super special massive thank you to my Patreon community. This year has been a Warhammerless year for MS Paints. And your support has basically kept me alive through that. <laughs> Assuming this video goes out on time, I will see you all in a couple of days for the Secret Santa unboxing play date on the MS Paints Discord. And I'll see the rest of you guys next time on MS Paints, and we're going to go back to basics. Cheers, I'm out of here.